Hey, this is Joe Todd, November 1st, 1982, an interview with Roy Wheatley and Ruth Wheatley. Mr. Wheatley, where were you born? Oklahoma, Oklahoma. When? June 16, 1915. Mrs. Wheatley, where were you born? Uh, in Wichita, Kansas. When? October 21st, 1983. No. Eighteen. <laughs> Eighteen is. Eighteen. Ninety-three. Yeah, Eighteen ninety-three. Yeah. Eighteen ninety-three, yeah. I guess. This year, people ask me how old am I. I say I can't remember whether it is eighty-nine or ninety-eight. <laughs> 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 Let me move this. <laughs> You were born in Wichita, Kansas. Wichita, Kansas. When did you first come to Oklahoma? When I was about a year and a half old, and we came to Ponca City. There was uh, a reason, I think, why we would come to Oklahoma from Kansas. And I suppose the reason was uh, my father, had, he was really a frontier man, a pioneer, and uh, he had worked for the government hauling freight from Wichita to Fort Reno uh, with supplies for the soldiers that was there, and uh, I suppose they also uh, gave help to the Indians from there too. So he had traveled over uh, the uh, territory, it was those days, Indian territory, and uh, he uh, knew the land very well and liked the land. And uh, Ponca City at that time was a thriving young town, uh, just uh, <clears throat> board sidewalks and dusty streets and uh, most of uh, the Indians, there were two reservations around Ponca City, the Ponca's and the Osage. Now my father was a photographer in Wichita and he manufactured uh, a sensitized paper that uh, used in the photography work and uh, he was uh, very good, so when we went to Ponca City, he opened up the home gallery in Ponca City. Where was that located in Ponca City? you remember the location of it? No, that's a shame. I had a pink satin ribbon about so long that I gave to a friend a few years ago that had all the businesses in Ponca City lo uh, uh, listed and located. But now the home gallery, I don't have any idea, only that it was a, a small wooden frame building and it did have a wood sidewalk out in front. The Indians loved to have the pictures made. And they, uh, they came often and uh, loitered around this uh, gallery. The Indian children and women sat out on the sidewalk and I sat with them okay, from about one and a half year until we left there when I was about four and a half perhaps. And at length of time, the Indians were my most, uh, oh, uh, greatest interest, I guess. I did. There was not many other things in Ponca City, you know, and I was always glad to see them. They were very colorful very quiet. I couldn't understand anything they would say, of course. And uh, we went along just wonderfully well. So when uh, uh, they uh, would come and uh, spend most of their money and their time loitering around, they didn't seem to be very ambitious except to get this allotment check you know, from the government, and it was issued there in Ponca City. So as my father freighted through the territory, hauling uh, uh, the uh, supplies, he had many, many uh, hair-raising uh, experiences with 
the uh, Indians. They were a savage people then, and uh, they resented the white men trespassing on their hunting grounds, killing the buffalo and taking the hides. It was a shame, and the re they resented and fought for it, you know. And it was uh, nothing uncommon for the uh, wagon trains to be burned as they tried to cross the, the prairie. One time, my father came upon a scene that saddened him. He had a friend, Pat Hennessy, who uh, uh, was uh, a government agent, and he was crossing the prairie at that time with a wagon, and the Indians murdered him and burned his belongings took his horses, and Papa came upon that scene and helped to bury Pat Hennessy. That was a long time ago. Where did this happen? Near Hennessy. Hennessy is named for Pat Hennessy. Yes. Another time, <clears throat> he came upon a scene. There were two men seemed appearing more to be the outlaw type. There were cowboys and outlaws and uh, travelers <coughs> across the prairie, different tr uh, kinds of people, you know. Well, anyway, this time he uh, saw these two men dragging a younger man. And they were taking him to a hanging tree. You know, they had hanging trees along the route. And they were going to hang him, accusing him of stealing their horse. He was riding a good horse. And my father intervened and fled for the young man's life. And they, uh, I believe, thought my father was a lawman too. And they did release him. And it's life was saved that way. What year was that? Do you, do you know? Do you remember? That was before statehood. That was before... Uh, that must have been in the early 1800s. No, early 1900s. No, that was... Uh, you see, the run was 1889. Uh, and that was quite a while before that. Did you say early 1800s? You, you mean that wouldn't be the early 1800s, would it? Quite a while before uh, the run. Well, that's 1907. No, no, no. 1889. It's hard, you know, to remember that. When was Mr. Hennessy killed? You know what year that was? No, but the <coughs> Oklahoma history book will tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was pretty famous. Um, he, yes, he was a, a very famous person in o early Oklahoma history, and they named the town for him. And he was a friend of my father's. Now, I grew up uh, interested in uh, these pioneer stories that my father had to tell because he was in so many uh, exciting places. And uh, the, uh, the Grimes fairy tales were not as interesting to me as uh, those uh, exciting tales of uh, uh, survival, you know. And it took that to be a pioneer and survive, where there was no law and order, you were on your own. I think perhaps as he traveled through the uh, territory, it was um, more by instinct uh, than by uh, compass. You know. What was your father's name? Will Keir. K-I-E-R. What were some of his the stories that you remember about? Uh, now, farther back than the uh, territory days, he lived in Kansas. I have a document that I found here the other day. He had a little farm, and this was dated in... Uh,
1864, I think, but you'll find it there. 79, 1879, more than 100 years ago. That's a deed to the farm in Kansas. That's a deed, the farm in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of a house with a lid. That is about as old a paper I think as I may have. One thing I remember my grandpa, he could sure shoot. There was, was two boys in our family and two boys in Mama's sister. And we, he'd take us all hunting. And uh, he taught us all to shoot. But I was the youngest. And he had a, a 10 gauge shotgun. The barrel was low near that wall over there. But anyhow, he'd take us hunting. We all had four tents, or, or well, one or two of them, I guess, even had the 12 gauge. But a rabbit would get up. And we'd all shoot and shoot. And just about time he was out of sight, you'd hear that old shotgun his go off. And he, he never missed anything yet that he shot at. I never saw before he could hit anything. And he said he'd kill buffalo with that shotgun, I believe. Oh, yes, that it was, was a buffalo gun. Was and it had hammers that big on its shield. You don't have hammers if I can just hang on to it. It would sure kick. Yeah, kick him over the head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was, that Wichita, was this near Wichita, Kansas? Wichita, Kansas. And uh, <coughs> this little farm, I think, was near Caldwell. That's, uh, it seemed to me I hear stories of Caldwell. <coughs> Now, the, do you remember in history of hearing of the Hayfield Massacre in Kansas? Do you remember hearing yes, that? Well, my father's neighbors, and I have had a picture of them, each one their names, were in battle. Uh, it was the uh, county seat of the Woodsdale and Hugoton, Kansas. They were fighting over the county seat. And uh, they were, what I mean, fighting with guns. There was just no uh, arbitrating. They were going to shoot it out. And they did. And my father's neighbors, and he was supposed <clears throat> to have met them and gone with them. They were going to meet at a certain place and perhaps discuss or shoot it out about what to do with the settling of this county seat. And my father's neighbors were all shot down and died except one man, his name was Frank Tate. Now I did have their pictures and I've looked since I talked to you to find that uh, little picture but I did not find it. Now there was a judge at that time, Judge Sam Woods, and he was a very good friend of my father's. And the trial then came up under his jurisdiction. But there was so much uh, hostile uh, among the people there that he uh, took the trial to Texas for a fair trial. And my father went with him uh, to uh, the ones that murdered this group, perhaps, uh, if it would have been the other way. Maybe they would have been the ones that, uh, if they'd have had the first shot. But it was a sad thing, and uh, I've heard them tell about that. They knew that this battle was going to come. And uh, around my father's little plot of land, he strung wire, barbed wire. And my mother, who was, they were young then, very young, newly married, uh, she lay with a shotgun out by that fence all night waiting to see if they would come to their house. That was just as uh, the uh, pioneers, that's the way they had to face things, you know. The reason my father did not join his friends as he had intended to, he came home from where he was working and uh, he could not catch his pet horse, a horse that all he had to do was call Nell, that was her name, and she would not come to him, and he could not catch her anyway, and he chased her until near dark and never could get his horse. If he could have, uh, when he did, it was too dark to uh, trail the ones that had gone ahead of him, and that way he missed the massacre. That was one of the stories that I could uh, remember him uh, telling. Then uh, his life was uh, eventful. 
from the beginning. He was uh, born in Canada. His parents were uh, Scotch, came from Scotland, and uh, their ancestors were an interesting people. <laughs> the name Keir came from the Queen of the Isle of Man. That's a little island off the coast of Scotland. And she married a commoner in Scotland, and he took the name Keir. And that was uh, the grandparents a few generations back. Then uh, the grandmother was Helen McGregor, and uh, she was uh, uh, of the clan that uh, were more of the uh, refined, educated uh, clan, I believe, in Scotland. He, we also had relatives there. The MacDougalls were the fighting clan. <laughs> but you know, the Scotch people were in clans. Yes, ma'am. And when they came to Canada, I had those dates, but it was certainly a long time ago. My father now would have been way over a hundred years old, and uh, in fact, I'd be near 90, and he was 35 years older than I was. So you see, it uh, put the pilgrimage from um, Scotland uh, to Canada in the 1700s. They, they raised a, a large family, or had uh, a large family of 11 boys <clears throat> and two girls, and then adopted two. And uh, the, a primitive way of life. Once a year, the shoemaker would come and make shoes for them. And was this in Canada? Or in Canada. Canada. In Canada. And uh, the, they had to be a rugged people to survive. The grandmother wove the material that they made their clothes out of, so you can't imagine a woman having that many children and making their clothes and, and weaving the uh, yarn to make the clothes. In Canada, of course, they're very cold up what there. What part of Canada? Chatham, and that's not far, I think, from Montreal. Okay. Yes. I know where that is. Yeah. Then uh, they all took the typhoid fever, and knowing very little about treatment of disease, the father and five of the boys died in one week. Then uh, my father and uh, an older brother, Duncan, came to the United States. They were in their teenage. And uh, they worked all summer for a farmer in Iowa. And uh, at the end of the summer, they, they slept that summer out uh, in the barn hayloft. At the end of the summer, the, the man gave them each a new pair of breeches and I'll think 50 cents, but it must have been more. That's what I remember. But, uh, of course, these stories are very old, and uh, but very true. And uh, then my father and his brother came to Wellington, Kansas. And uh, that uh, in Wellington, Kansas, then is where it was when he purchased this uh, property. Just two of the boys come to Wellington? Uh, I think later there were t others, and the mother. They all came to Wellington, and uh, there was one, Tommy Cure there, a banker, and uh, there was a brother, Bob. The one that I knew, the only one I knew. What was it? Charlie. Charlie, yeah. Yes, Charlie. Mm -hmm. And there was a... But uh, did he ever come to, or did he go to Colorado, or did he come down to, I wonder, Kansas? Yeah, uh, yes. I wonder. Uh, yes, they were all around Wellington, and then Uncle, oh. Uncle Charlie went oh. to Colorado Springs, yeah. 
and Uncle Bob went out to Crystal River, uh, uh, that little uh, place. Oh, out, yeah. uh, that's where they yeah. finally, from Oklahoma, the people all went. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, after the Hayfield uh, massacre, of course, that was uh, always exciting. You could hear my prophet tell that, and you would just chill with fear. Then again, he would tell of uh, making the run in Oklahoma, you know, into territory, and uh, for settlement. And Is this uh, the run of '89. In the '89, mm -hmm. yes. Then uh, he uh, had that he never owned much wealth of any kind, but he did always have to have dependable good horses, one good dog and a good gun. Those three things were a must for a pioneer. Yeah. He, uh, he made the run and brought three friends from Wichita. That must have been an exciting day that you, uh, if you were lived through it, you would never forget it. These uh, anxious people lined up on the line, Kansas line, waiting for the shop, you know, to say go. And when they started, they were such a wild, yelling crowd, you know. And uh, many of them didn't make it. Many of the horses would think uh, from exhaustion. And the men were whipping their uh, teams to make them go beyond their natural speed. And uh, wagons were losing their wheels, and uh, it was a riot, really. But my father had the good team, the good wagon, light wagon, and these friends, and they made it to Guthrie. And there is where they settled, uh, staked their claims. Then uh, that was uh, an experience that was always exciting to hear of the run. And we've all seen many pictures of it, you know, and it, uh, it was something to have lived through. How long did he stay on his claim? He did not stay long in Oklahoma because at that time he was trying to make something out of this little farm in Kansas. He got married about that time and uh, he stayed uh, in Kansas and did well, but uh, he seemed to have misfortune more than his share. One time he lost his whole herd of cattle in a blizzard. A blizzard that happened uh, along in the early 80s. It's mentioned in history. And he was at that time on a trip uh, through the territory hauling the uh, supplies. And when that it was uh, Indian summer and pretty weather when he left Kansas, but before he got back, the blizzard had hit and his cattle were dead in the field. Things like that would have happened to give him a uh, back set, but he was a man that never uh, lost uh, hope. He, every day he got up, he was a determined little Scotchman and jolly, and uh, he was a cheerful person courage and strength. So uh, then after we uh, lived uh, in uh, Ponca City. You came there in, uh, and when did you come to Ponca City? What year? 1891, I would say. I was about a year and a half old and I was born in 93 or 4, now I could be a little bit strong there, but it was 1891 or 2, we came to Ponca City. And that was really the story I was going to tell. You see, I liked these little Indians, and uh, they were about the only people I knew. It was the only thing I had to be interested in. And one night, when, in, as usual, I was not in sight. My parents was wondering well, where was the child and uh, couldn't be found. They knew immediately 
that the Indians had taken me and uh, to the reservation. Of course, my father and the townspeople, I'm sure, made a very fast trip to the reservation. And I was there sitting with the Indians, seemingly not much frightened, but uh, sitting there and uh, they didn't harm me and they didn't resist when my father came. But I, I'm sure I was a very happy child to see my father come. But uh, I doubt if they would ever have taken me back. It was um, nothing uncommon for Indians to uh, raise a white child. And uh, they were still uh, far from civilization. They didn't understand the ways of the white man. And uh, to them, that uh, what it Okay, you were talking about as a little girl when your father came back to get you from the Indians. That's right. Mm -hmm. How long did you spend with the Indians? That no, not episode? overnight, no. Mm -hmm. uh, it was night when they, when they came to get me and took me and they, there was no fight about it. But I will say, I believe I must be the only living person now who can say they had been kidnapped by the Indians. I believe I must be the only one in Oklahoma that can what, say that. What do you remember about their village? It's teepees and... Uh, Are they canvas or buffalo hide? Or do you, do you remember? They seem to me canvas. They really seem to be. And were they Ponca or Osage? I think these look like Osage. I believe. They, they look more dressy, you know, more educated. I believe the Osage, of course, now they're the rich tribe too. Well, besides, uh, I think we mentioned that to be pioneering, you must. Uh, uh, I have uh, a good team, a good gun, a good dog, and be very sensitive to surroundings. You uh, would travel more by intuition than by compass. And there would be uh, some uh, uh, some signals along the way, landmarks that you would recognize if you went through the country a time or two, you would expect to see the same landmarks again, you know. And perhaps you would pass a little clearing where some homesteader had settled and had maybe a little garden started with a fence around it. You would notice that and expect to see it your next trip. Yeah, and you would, uh, with uh, you would see some covered wagons traveling. You would see uh, some uh, cattle trails where they were driving cattle through the territory from Texas up to Wichita. And uh, you would. Uh, as you would uh, have uh, been there before, you would notice your keen eyes, as my father had the keenest blue eyes and could see such a distance. He would notice off in the distance the smoke signals of where the Indians uh, would uh, uh, signal to another Indian village that uh, there were uh, white men approaching and entering their hunting ground and uh, that was a uh, cause for alarm and many times murder and burning and, and it was uh, a, a dangerous voyage through the territory at that time. The buffalo hunters uh, 
killing off the buffalo just for the hides was, that was uh, no wonder the Indians resented it. My father resented it. He was uh, asked uh, at times to join the uh, uh, government uh, regiment army, you know, to be stationed at uh, some of the forts. But he had no uh, wish to fight the Indians. He, he could see the mistreatment. They, they were badly treated. The, they had smoked pipes of, pipe of peace too many times to be disappointed. And they'd signed too many treaties that were no good. They could not trust uh, the white people. So they resented them, and uh, it was uh, no wonder that they did. And you could see the smoke of uh, campers along the way. The, the white people. So they resented them, and uh, it was uh, no wonder that they did. And you could see the smoke of uh, campers along the way, and uh, the smoke of a wagon train being burned. There were many uh, signs uh, that you would recognize. Uh, there was no communication, but those smoke signals told a big story. There was a lot to tell. There were fur traders and horse thieves and cattle drivers and hanging trees <laughs> along the way. Those were uh, signposts that, uh, that have to be remembered. Now, after uh, I had been, I will to say, kidnapped and returned, uh, it was not much more. Perhaps that had something to do with the decision, and my mother's health not too good, they decided uh, that they would uh, take the invitation offered from my uncle in Colorado, Uncle Bob, and uh, go out to uh, uh, his cabin along the Crystal River, that's on the western slope of Colorado Mountains, near Redstone, a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, they started uh, uh, the idea of making a, a trip by wagon from Ponca City to Colorado. There were um, three other neighbors who decided to make the trip also. There was one single man who had a light rig, not a covered, a heavy covered wagon. There was uh, the friends, the doctor and his wife with a covered wagon and another neighbor with six children, and they had a covered wagon. So we had a wagon train and started to Colorado. It took from May until in the fall to go from Ponca City through western Kansas and on over the mountains. Uh, a summer in a covered wagon is an experience I'm thankful to have had these pioneer parents. Uh, otherwise, you, you can't imagine just how uh, life is uh, when you uh, live just from day to day as taking the weather and the uh, disadvantages that might happen and dangers, of course, is responsibility no doubt, to keep the uh, wagons in good order. <coughs> Wheels had to be greased. Horses had to be cared for. And uh, food had, had to be furnished from some source. How did you get the food on the trip to Colorado? <coughs> I'm sure they took enough uh, flour that we'd always uh, have uh, uh, Dutch oven biscuits. And uh, along the way, now, there were some uh, scattered farming homes along in there. And uh, they, they could always buy a few supplies. Then uh, that is uh, something the farmers might have, you know, to sell. <coughs> then, of course, uh, 
my father uh, could almost go out and get a rabbit or something with his gun anytime. And you know they'd have uh, some meat along like that. What and, year was it that you went to Colorado? Do you, do you remember? 1896, I think, was the year that we went from Caponca City to uh, Colorado. When we left uh, Ponca City. You just didn't go to Colorado, too. You went way up in the middle of Colorado, you know? Yes, over the mountains. <laughs> yeah, yeah we were on the western yeah. slope with the covered wagon. The roads certainly were not paving. <laughs> they were as rocky and rough as they could be and dangerous. We would get out and walk behind the wagon and put rocks under the wheels so it wouldn't slip back, you know? I can remember it, and I was very young. But you won't hardly forget uh, a trip like that. I've been to Colorado several times since, by plane and otherwise. <laughs> but uh, you won't forget a covered wagon trip. That's uh, a pioneer uh, event. Well, what do you remember most about the trip on the prairie going out to Colorado? In the evenings, uh, it was fun. We would play around the campfire. And uh, one evening, this is not anything of importance for history, but it was uh, something I would remember. I was sitting on a log by uh, where we had made camp, and I commenced screaming, and there was something on my back. I said, a bug on my back, and it was a chipmunk. Mm -hmm. And it was just digging up uh, on my back, couldn't get out. It was under my dress, you see. Uh, <laughs> and I was screaming. <laughs> now, that was the most frightening thing. Again, on this uh, trip, it was exciting. Uh, there was uh, a fence, the pasture. And uh, first, along the road, my father saw a long, large snake. And something that was not a native snake, he had never seen anything like that in Kansas or Oklahoma. And they decided it must have been from a circus that was going through and the heat, uh, it died of heat. And uh, that one we passed and on farther over the fence hung another one, the mate to that one, I suppose, that was uh, from ground the ground over the fence. Those large snakes were something we remembered. And again, one that was not dead, uh, Papa was walking along and my sister with him. And uh, why they were walking along by the wagon, I don't know, but uh, all of a sudden he yelled for my sister to stop in her tracks. And he saw a rattler, and he had a hatchet, and he threw this hatchet at that rattler and killed it right in front of them. So, of course, you have to be alert to be a pioneer. It's, uh, uh, there, you, ha you face uh, danger all the time, you know. And the trip uh, from Tonka City was... Uh, to me, most pleasant, because I had no responsibility. I was young and just enjoyed everything. Life was fun. And when we got to, to my uncle's cabin, the most picturesque cabin, the log cabin, I suppose, he'd built it himself. And out the side of it, there was a little house he had built, and the water ran through it. And uh, there he kept the milk and things as cold as ice, you know. And in this, uh, uh, that fall that we uh, got there, it was time to gather potatoes. And that is a potato uh, 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 region in there. They grow wonderful potatoes, as good as the Idaho potatoes. And uh, it was time to uh, dig the potatoes. And we were all working like mad to get the potatoes harvested. 
And that was another scene that, uh, having seen it once, you'll never forget it. The mountain was on fire. The whole mountain up behind this uh, little log cabin was ablaze. And there came a man riding down the, by the river. There was a road by the river, and he was warning every uh, uh, person along the river to make uh, ready to get to the river because uh, if uh, the fire didn't stop, nothing would be saved, you know. And it was an exciting time. And we hastened uh, to uh, get as many potatoes as we could into the cellar there at my uh, dugout thing that my uh, uncle had, you know. And to uh, have a fire raging towards you is frightening. Uh, that's another thing I'll never forget. Did it burn the cabin down? They, it did not burn the cabin down. The wind changed, and uh, uh, it did not come that far. But from on up there, it, it certainly did. And while we lived there uh, 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 with uh, this uncle, my father and uh, my uncle and a neighbor, his name was Bill Bat, went hunting. Uh, of course, that every uh, fall, the men would go hunting. And uh, we always had deer and bear meat. And I have one picture of where they had brought the deer in, and uh, they arranged them to look like they were alive. They kind of stood them up by posts, you know, and the men were down like they were getting ready to shoot, but they had already killed the deer and brought them in. And they had a smokehouse, and they would smoke uh, the meat, you know, the venison. And uh, the bear meat, I can't remember so much about it, but they always uh, killed a bear. And uh, my father used that uh, bear grease to grease his boots, and <laughs> Mama said he put it on his hair. <laughs> but anyway, the bear grease was useful in the pioneer days, you know. We lived there at this uncle's cabin for quite some time, and then uh, we uh, built, uh, my father was building a new home near the uncle's home. My sister and I were interested, of course, uh, in the building, and we were over there playing around. How old were you during this period? Uh, well, I was uh, six or seven. And your sister was? Um, uh, five years older. And we were in the new house that was being built and decided there was a fireplace in it, that yeah. yeah, we'd uh, use the uh, shingle <coughs> and start a fire. So the men were up on the roof putting shingles on. We uh, made a fire in the fireplace. And the roof, uh, the shingles hadn't covered the flue, and the whole thing was on fire. So my sister and I <laughs> felt that we had caused excitement. We had caused the new house to get on fire. But the men up there worked so fast and, and got off burning shingles and it didn't burn down. And later then we moved to Redstone and lived there for several years. And we had a very pretty home in Redstone. And this was our home in Redstone. And we lived there uh, several years, and uh, from there we went back to Kansas. Back to Wichita? Uh, back to Wichita. And from Wichita, uh, yeah, that was my father's always through all of these uh, pioneer days. Uh, he practiced photography. Why did you move back to Wichita? My, uh, uh, my brother was born in uh, while we lived here in this house. Redstone. In Redstone, and he had a heart condition. And the doctor said, get him away from that high altitude, and we moved back to Kansas. And uh, my father then uh, was uh, interested in photography. And uh, it was from there, we moved uh, from Kansas to Okemo. 
Okima was just a little town. What year did you move to Okima? I was born in 15, I said Ralph was born in 13, so he was there I was born somewhere. in 11, and uh, I guess along about 1970. It was uh, another pioneer. Uh, little town, thriving little town. Was it before statehood or after statehood? Uh, that was before statehood. Okay. Yes, that was before statehood. Yeah, you were living there because you got the paper in 1907 and kept it for years. Yes, yes. I oh, had uh, the first paper of statehood, uh, and that was in 1907. It was before that, of course. What was your first impression of Okima? Oh, I did not like it. And, uh, I didn't want to go uh, on that trip. We went by wagon from, from Kansas uh, to Okima. You went by a wagon from Kansas to Okima. To Okima. Papa had a friend in Okima that had uh, they'd corresponded, and he said uh, he thought Papa would uh, uh, like uh, Okima, and uh, Papa was always ready for a new frontier. I say uh, uh, Okima grew up, and I think I grew up with Okima. Uh, I. Uh, went to school and graduated from high school in Okima. What year? And well, I was married in uh, 1911, so I think uh, I must have graduated in about 1910. Then I was married in 1911 to Carl Wheatley, <coughs> and uh, my children were born in Okima. went to school there. And uh, we had some very good days in Okima. How many children, children did you have? Two, Ralph and Roy. Then 
I think maybe the depression hit us harder than it hit anybody. <laughs> it wiped us out. <laughs> what did you and your husband do during this period? He was depression? in the automobile business and did well. And uh, the oil boom down at Cromwell near Okima made uh, uh, lots of business through uh, the automobile and uh, uh, my husband had trucks running down to the oil field all every day, you know, and he made money. And uh, we built a beautiful new home in Okima. And it seemed that the future looked bright. But uh, some way the uh, planning uh, and management uh, must have been all wrong. I knew very little about the business affairs, but we lost everything. And that is uh, a sad thing in life. Uh, next to death, I think when you lose all your possessions, you're shocked, you know. And we came to, uh, we left then, and came rather a sad time in life to Oklahoma City. My husband not only lost his uh, hopes uh, for a financial future, he lost his health. He was never a well person again. And uh, when we came to Oklahoma City, uh, it was uh, just a matter of survival. Uh, the boys were young, but they worked hard, and uh, it was hard to attend school and, and work. And I did, I did what I could, and um, uh, it was rather difficult with a sick husband uh, to uh, uh, Make, uh, it wasn't bad. There just me. wasn't no groceries, or no clothes, or no nothing. <laughs> it was a, a situation. How did you, did, did you work during this period? Uh, uh, during the time of his illness, I could hardly leave the house. But after he passed away in 1940, I uh, attended business school, brushed up a little on my <coughs> typing and so forth, and uh, got uh, a job out of the Capitol. And uh, I worked, uh, I think Governor Turner was governor at that time. Jay Lee was uh, my first boss in the welfare department, at that time emergency relief board. And I worked then 17 years for um, the uh, welfare department. Mm -hmm. When I retired, uh, I was old enough and tired enough, and uh, they gave me a, a wonderful party, a going away party. There were more than a hundred people came to my party. And I was going to slip out without telling anyone that I was going. But uh, they knew it, and uh, I was so surprised, and we had a great uh, uh, going away party for me. And since then, uh, I've attended nearly all of the retiree parties, and they've had one every year. This year, they had a party uh, celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the statehood. And uh, they gave me a beautiful gift, this uh, book. And it also has all their names in it. And uh, uh, the department where I work have just uh, and been... Somebody Loves You by Helen Steiner Rice? Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. I have a little book here that my sister wrote. Down memory lane. Now this is our uh, journey from Ponca City to uh, Colorado. She wrote this book when she was uh, past 80. And it's, it's an interesting booklet, and uh, the, it looks like the covered wagon perhaps we traveled in. And it tells of our leaving Ponca City and uh, the route we took through Kansas. And uh, the, uh, here's a picture of uh, the home in uh, Redstone. Sorry, you there. And uh, so it, she has it well written. Now this little granddaughter in uh, Tulsa, she and her husband travel quite a lot. 
<laughs> and uh, they had taken me on wonderful vacations one time to this same place in Colorado. And uh, two years ago, when she was out there, she bought a very nice uh, uh, booklet uh, out there. It was called The Saga of uh, Redstone, Crystal River. And uh, it tells about uh, my father and my sister and my mother and myself and living there uh, in uh, Redstone. And uh, it was interesting to us to see uh, this little booklet. Uh, I don't even know who wrote it, but uh, mention us in there. Redstone was a great place. <coughs> and, uh, a millionaire named J.C. Osgood uh, developed uh, this little Redstone town. He uh, developed it for the uh, ore. They mined and made coke, and they had coke ovens, and they worked a large crew of Italians. And uh, he built homes for all the people that worked for him. And this home of ours was built by Mr. Osgood, and my father was the gamekeeper. He had a large fenced-in side of a mountain with animals, deer and elk and the uh, native animals of Colorado. And my father uh, tended to the, keeping these uh, game. And it was an interesting place to live. And that from there is uh, the place that we uh, had to leave on account of my baby brother and move back to Kansas. But uh, we had an interesting life out there. So I've had a life that was uh, uh, many, many good days and a few through the Depression that were just as bad as they could get. But I've had wonderful children and wonderful grandchildren. And Scottish I, people are very prejudiced, you know, okay. Yes. <laughs> And then uh, I appreciated working for the state for 20 years, and uh, that was um, uh, a different life, you know, when you work uh, and supposed to be on the job every morning at 8 o'clock. And stayed till five for a while. Later, they changed it and gave a little shorter days. When you work all day every day of the week, your life is mostly uh, sold to your employer. You, you don't have much life of your own, you know. But I did during that time. We bought a lovely home over on East Eleven, and uh, it was a large home and beautiful home. And we enjoyed living there <clears throat> until we moved into this little house. But again, that was a great disappointment. The neighborhood changed. When I bought the place, soon after my husband died, <coughs> it was a lovely neighborhood, proud people, and uh, homes well kept, <clears throat> and uh, a good location. And uh, I was very happy there, and the home <clears throat> was more <clears throat> more beautiful than <clears throat> anything uh, that I had had before or will ever have again. The old solid oak inside the privy. This cabinet there is some of the, the material I brought from the old house. But after the neighborhood changed, <clears throat> The uh, colored people who, uh, at that time, there was a group who seemed to uh, uh, have a profession of robbing older people, and I was robbed time and again. What, what year was there, sir? Well, let's see, that was, I moved over here in seven years ago this month, and uh, so about 64 or 5 or so, I guess. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, perhaps. 
it, it was a, a dangerous place for uh, elderly people. My sister lived with me at that time, but uh, she was injured and had to leave, and uh, she died last year in uh, Amarillo. No, this year. Huh? Yeah, this year. Yeah, just this year, this June. This hasn't been the best year for me. Yeah, I had an accident uh, this year. I've had arthritis for some time, and uh, that's a miserable uh, disease. But I stepped on a needle right here in this room <laughs> and broke it off in my foot. And uh, it was not really a needle, it was a long dressmaker pin, but it was shaped is steel like a needle and had a pretty head on it. And when it broke off in my foot, I knew I was in for trouble. And in trouble it was. Went to the doctor and uh, he x-rayed it, Dr. Wallraven, and he said, uh, you're going to have trouble. He said, uh, we'll send you to hospital and had Dr. Arnold uh, try to get it out. They tried with local to get it out, but I went into shock. They had to just split my foot open. A little needle between the bones, you know, we couldn't get it out. So they had to put me in the hospital as a patient and uh, operate with a general anesthetic. At that time, after having uh, the first local, which shocked me uh, beyond uh, endurance, I, they, they got the pen after the second operation, but They, they got the pen after the second operation, but uh, my heart gave out. And they gave me a pacemaker for $10,000. <laughs> uh, it almost left me. Yeah. They still laugh about yeah. <laughs> getting sold on a pacemaker. And, and that yeah. was the Step on a needle and go uh, $10,000 yeah. $10, in the hospital. It was a very bad year for me, and it's uh, I haven't recovered too well, really. Do you remember the Spanish-American War? No, I do not. Uh, uh, my uh, people were never uh, much of soldiers. They, uh, I never have had many soldiers in my uh, immediate family. Of course, during the war, uh, I had a nephew and my sister's son that was uh, uh, a colonel in the war. And, uh, he was a doctor. Isn't that in the World War One? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, bound to be. 1917, 1918. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh huh. Yes. What did you do during that war? First World War. Did you? We lived in Okemo, and uh, my husband was in business there. Automobile business doing well, and uh, I did have very close relatives in the war. Of course, I was uh, concerned, and uh, I did what I could for Red Cross. And what did you do for the Red Cross? Knit. <laughs> did, you, did you knit? Yes. Like knit socks? Or yeah, something? sweaters, socks, mm -hmm. scarves, things like that. Roll bandages, you know, and uh, uh, did what uh, you could through the Red Cross. You know. While you're raising your family. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. What do you remember of the dust bowl, the dust storms? 
the Dust Bowl was before my time. I'm thankful. No. no. What, the Dust Bowl? The Dust dust Bowl, this was in the 30s. Yeah, in the 30s. In where the Dust Bowl? California. Oh, yes. In the Depression. Oh. I, I don't remember much about that. Uh, Boy, I do. We were here in Oklahoma City. Oh, you couldn't get your breath. You couldn't even open the windows or nothing. It was really a, a terrible experience. Oh, yeah. A sad so... thing that uh, Western Oklahoma was just blown away. Well, most all of Oklahoma, and people just went yeah, by the. Uh, they load their little old Fords, overload, put a mattress on top and a tub on the side, and off they'd start, you know. Did you ever consider going to California? <laughs> Not to live. I've been there many times. And uh, my uh, daughter-in-law, Roy's wife, her family nearly all moved out there and lived there. and. Uh, uh, they have, uh, Roy and Ella, that's his wife, have taken me many times to visit uh, out in California, and uh, they have loved it out there, but uh, a good many who did go to California finally wanted to come back to Oklahoma. What did you do during World War II? As I say, I've never had any soldiers to go right out of my home, and I can't hardly remember making any different uh, arrangements in my life on the account of the war. Did you do any Red Cross work during World War II? Or? I always have, yes. What did you do during that war, the Second World War? Well, about the same. I would help with the Red Cross, whatever the call would be that women could do. Do you remember what you did for them? Or? For, they would open these... Um, uh, Campaigns? Uh, where uh, the, the soldiers would be welcome. The you USO? Know. What is it? USO? Yes, yes, uh-huh. And of course, we would help with the food and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've invited them uh, to my home, you know, to for meals and uh, do what I could uh, to help. But I was never active in in uh, uh, war activities uh, because not having any children in war. Neither one of my boys were uh, physically able to uh, get into the service. So, uh, a little bit older than the ones they were taking, but in my lungs and in Ralph, I don't know what, except uh, he was just older and I don't know, I can't remember. He had allergies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He had Mr. allergies. Lee, are you the youngest or the yeah, youngest yeah. son? Yeah, I'm the baby. I got all the goodies. got all the goodies. So. What's your early memories of? You were born in Okima? Yeah, yeah. What's your early memories of Okima? Oh, that was wonderful for me. Because we had a real nice home. And I remember walking to school. It was about three or four blocks up some hills. And the old school. I remember going to school, of course. What name the school? Uh, the Noble School. Yeah, Noble. May Noble. Mm -hmm. Named after her. She was a teacher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember the streets. It was brick just down from the main street in Okima was Broadway. They called it Broadway. And it was made out of brick, and uh, so I remember that. And remember, on our street, when you go way on South Seventh, you come up to Broadway, and then you kind of go down for the more businesses. But there was no blacksmith shop over there, and it was fun to listen to the ring of those. That guy with that hammer, you could hear that ring for ten miles. But we sat there and watched him lots of times. Yes, that's blacksmith shop. I had to do a lot of blacksmithing. And of course, Dad was—he worked so hard, and he had, always had a dealership. Plus he had these trucks running that oil field. What and kind of trucks did he have for the oil field? Uh, they were just hauling pipe and different things, you know, in the oil field. He was a uh, dealership of Dodge. Uh -huh. And had a Ford, I think, at one time. Uh -huh. I think he had the Ford dealership. I know he had Dodge, too. Yeah, Dodge, Ford. mostly. Uh -huh. <laughs> I remember the Indians, of course. Uh, there were always lots Saturdays. of Indians there. Oh, yeah. They'd set out in these real hot. They sat out with them blankets all night, sat out up and down the street, yeah. and they'd eaten them ice cream all over them, flies. What were the Indians in Okima? 
Huh? What tribal group? The Creek. The Creek? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. A lot of Harjos and Tigers. Uh-huh. Harjos and Tigers. Yeah. But I enjoy the Indians. I always liked Indians. When did you graduate from high school? Here in Oklahoma City. Central. Central. 1930. So you were born in 1950, uh -huh. correct, in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. yeah. And you moved to Oklahoma City after the stock market crashed? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Closely after. Well, yes. well, that's what times were showing up. Soup lines, I mean, we won't sell anything off those. And you say you remember the Dust Bowl and the Depression oh, and all that? Oh, you bet. Oh, yes. You Tell me your impressions of the dust storms. Oh, it was just, it was awful. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't touch anything. And, uh, uh, your, uh, and you'd see it coming some days. Your bedding you know? would be sandy. Yeah. You know, there was no way to shut it out like the house. And it just seemed like, for a while it never quit. I just thought, well, I guess it's never going to. Mm -hmm. like How long would the dust storm last? Uh, well, uh, two or three days at a time, a lot of times. I'm well, sure. it, it, worked, it uh, ruined uh, the farmers for more than sure. one year. <coughs> it just covered their fields. Of course, we were more second than that boat. You know, the delivery things. And you worked to try to stay up. So you did work too. during this time on your motorcycle? Uh, I, no, I guess not in the dust bowl. Probably too young. I know I still. On school, but I did start riding motorcycles like before I ever got out of school. I started working with Beezies. Both of us did. Beezies, drug store, uh, making deliveries. Yeah. Uh -huh. This was what, yeah. in the late 20s? No, in the early 30s. Early 30s. Yeah. Okay. This is how you help the family get yeah, by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we used to walk from my house up to Twin Hills to Caddy for the, the golfers, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, where did you live in Oklahoma City? Uh, well, we lived two or three different places. We first come here, we lived on East 14th. Then we moved to East Park. Yes. And then we moved down in North Walden. And then, I guess, to 215. When you walked to Twin Hills to Caddy, where did uh, you live then at that time? Uh, I believe at that time on in East North Park, Walden. East Park, maybe. Uh, East Park. Either 1215 East Park. Or, uh, yeah, I guess that's what. How far of a walk would that be? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Six miles of space or more. You know where Twin Hill is? Yeah. yeah. Say from uh, That's that well, Ford uh, Park? Yeah. Well, it's uh, well, 63rd, you know. No, it's 63rd. Yeah. And it's one of the oldest in Brown, you know. Right. Beautiful place. I mean, and I was always younger than all the rest of the caddies. And those bags are the heaviest thing I have told in my life. <laughs> I can remember all of them things about. <laughs> what did you do during World War II? Did you do I had started building an airport down at Moore. Uh, what airport was it? Wheatley Airport. Wheatley Airport. We leased the ground and put up a couple of hangars and a big shop. Who, who built it? Uh, me and my partners. Uh, who were your partners? I got uh, uh, Jack Woosley, which is quite a man. He's in the papers a lot. And, uh, he was quite a pilot, really good pilot. I didn't, I didn't fly at the time. Well, I, you know, uh, we uh, went to Shawnee and bought these hangars that was up down there, but a field had closed down and moved those hangars up. They put them down here, but more right off the runway. It was right along the side of the railroad, real smooth, sod field, and everything paved with field and everything. Perfect field, perfect drainage and everything. Always land. How long is the Air Force still there? No. No. Tornado finally got the hangars and stuff. And, uh, and now, of course, it's all built up the homes. Because it just joined us right on the edge of Moore. I mean, practically in. Just 30 blocks to the bank. Mm -hmm. the back to, uh, uh, how long did the, was the Air Force in business? Uh, I guess 8 or 10 years. 10 years, maybe. We have, we have pictures <clears throat> after the uh, tornado hit. It's it just scattered that the hangars all metal. over that county. There were you know, beams in that thing, bent them like this, just bent them in a perfect arc. A lot of them, you know. And what year did you build the airport? Nineteen forty-nine or something. 
You know, that's you know, hard to make. It's hard to me. But I'll do it. But I'm 49. Mm -hmm. Or was it earlier than that? Maybe a little earlier than that. Carl died in 40, and uh, right it was after he had died, of course. And, uh, yeah. uh, it's hard to remember those dates, but uh, I had a lot of friends that had gone into the service, I know, long about the time I was in there. Uh, but, uh, anyway. It was while you were there yeah. that uh, uh, you came up for examination for service, and mm -hmm. they turned you down on account mm -hmm. of your lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, they thought <clears throat> it might be TB, and he was on a rest cure for that. Now, his condition now is not TB, and it's not cancer, and uh, he's had a terrible operation, cut his throat like this, you know, to go down into his lungs and cut in here to go into his lungs. And uh, it's fibrosis of the lungs, and uh, it's well, that, hard you know, to condemn. I have an airport down there, we put in a drag strip, which I had a lot of fun with for two or three summers. You know, the first drag strip was ever right. in Oklahoma that mounted anything. I had people lined up you know, half a mile on each side of that thing every Sunday. And it was so funny all through the winter, you know, you that bad weather, and we only, it was one Sunday, we didn't race all, all through the winter. That's a drag strip. I'd love to understand. Mrs. Wheatley, is there any, anything else you'd like to tell us about your experiences in Verde Bay, Oklahoma? Through it all, uh, I have enjoyed doing some writing. And uh, now I'm getting ready to uh, put a booklet together of poetry that I have written. And while I was trying to find some pictures uh, that I thought would be interesting at this time, I ran onto an old magazine that was published out of the capital called News and Views. And I looked there and I was surprised to see a poem here that I had written. I didn't know that it was in this magazine. Would you like to read it to us? Would you like to hear it? Yes, ma'am. It's a Thanksgiving uh, poem. Thanks be to God. Came friendly Indians with faces brown as leather to greet white men and have their feast together. Each placed upon the festive board his share, and then humbly paused to offer God a thankful prayer. The untilled land, the giant tree and tossing sea, around them lay in solemn majesty. So great, so splendid was their task on this vast shore. These brave men sought homes and wealth and more. They came from homelands far away for freedom's sake to worship God and pray. Stood nature strong <clears throat> in awesome grandeur then. Would it yield unconquered realms to these frail men? Frail men they were, but trusting God they dare to view the bleak unknown and to its might compare their simple faith with its sufficient power to proclaim a beam from glory as light upon a tower. With hearts such power reflecting, each thanked in his own way the God above for freedom to worship and to pray. On native ground where Indians met the pilgrim's band came millions more who sped across the land. Some came for greed and havoc then was wrought. Many a battle was waged and fought. Nature bowed to the blows and the shot and the shell. It seemed that men might turn paradise to hell. As highways ribbon the spaces across, only heaven can total the gain and the loss. Countless homes and factories and cities abound, but o'er the din of man-made alarms came a sound. It re-echoes o'er the years. We join the pilgrims today and thank God above all for freedom to worship and pray. 
That's excellent. That's Thanksgiving <laughs> thought. <laughs> I was surprised. I didn't know that that had been published, and uh, I found it just the other day. It has my name there. <laughs> um, have you been downtown recently? No. I downtown, as I used to know downtown, was uh, uh, I loved to go downtown. And all the years that I worked out at the Capitol, everybody that worked at the Capitol went to town on Saturday. And uh, there was everything I needed downtown. Brown's department store, Analog's cafeteria, the bank, and uh, it uh, was a pleasure to go downtown. Stores had everything that you would need, and uh, shopping was nice. But uh, I wouldn't know downtown at all now. It looks like a war disaster zone to me. So, of course, uh, at that time, living on East 11th, uh, my sister and I would go to town for, uh, I think, 50 cents in a taxi and uh, uh, spend the day and have lunch at Animods and do some shopping. And uh, it, it was, I loved downtown. At Christmas time, it was pretty downtown. Now the shopping centers uh, have uh, taken over, and uh, I don't go, uh, I very seldom go shopping. Uh, my arthritis has made it difficult for me to get around. And it's only for uh, something necessary, like to fit shoes or something like that, will I go shopping. The last time I went with Roy shopping, we both almost died from it. We went up to Quail Creek. I saw uh, there was a sale advertised on mattresses, and I thought I needed a new mattress for my bed. And we went out to uh, Dillard's in Quail Creek. It was new. We hadn't been there. And I walked so poorly, and uh, I had already had a heart attack the year before. Well, we walked through, that's the biggest store I ever saw. We walked through Dillard's, the length of it, to the elevator to go down into the basement where the uh, bedding department was. And we shopped, and I did, by the mattress. Then, of course, I had to walk back to the elevator and back through the store again. We uh, went early, and neither one of us had really had breakfast before we went. And uh, we decided we would eat out here at the uh, pancake house, you know, when we through with our shopping. We stopped in there and uh, ordered, and uh, all of a sudden I couldn't see, and I knew I was uh, having another light heart attack. So uh, we have laughed about that shopping trip nearly killing me, and I think that would be my last never taking me shopping no more. <laughs> she ain't never taking me no more shopping. <laughs> I thought I had to go to the hospital <laughs> anyway, but it was uh, not a serious attack, and I came through it pretty well. So. And were you for votes for women? What is it? Were you for votes for women, women suffrage? It's, uh, to me, it doesn't appeal to me too much. I think women have uh, always had their way, and uh, they can vote, and... Uh, now, this is for women suffrage back in the 20s. Oh. I, I think uh, that it was due to come. I think they had been deprived 
of uh, what they deserved. I think so. I think the man uh, voted their self to be the leader. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the women more or less uh, abided by their decision and was not always fair. And I think that they should have uh, equal uh, 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 whatever has been accumulated, whatever good has come to a family, the women desi uh, deserve their part, their share of it. I believe them doing their part and uh, being uh, rewarded accordingly to you. I think women should do a fair share and receive a fair share. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you think that? Yes, ma'am. I certainly believe them that they should do uh, their share. And uh, what is the first? Who was the first president that you remember? Well, it seems to me that I hadn't uh, been much interested in presidents until Roosevelt. Did he get locked out? Thank you. Yeah. Did you get locked out? Yeah. No, I didn't know it would do that. Yeah. yeah. That was this. Theodore Roosevelt or Franklin Roosevelt? Well, now Theodore Roosevelt, he was the one that signed Oklahoma into Right. Yes. Well, I, I didn't remember that. But I should have. That was 1907. 1907. Yes, I, re I remember that, the signing of that treaty. Sure. Oh, well, he would have been the first one that uh, I ever uh, would have uh, really remembered. I don't remember Lincoln and Washington. <laughs> <laughs> they were my favorites. <laughs> but of course, uh, I liked uh, Theodore, uh, and then uh, Roosevelt uh, later, you know, and uh, of course, I liked uh, presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and uh, Well, I think this. I think we've covered most everything about Oklahoma history and your part in it, yes. and uh, your travels. And I've enjoyed this a little bit. And you do have a fascinating life. Yes, it's been uh, eventful. Mm -hmm. yes. And I appreciate you sharing it with me. Well, we've appreciated you coming. Would you uh, have coffee? If I go make some coffee, would you like a cup of coffee? Yes, ma'am. Thank well, you. Well, that would be great. Um, Mrs. Wheatley, you mentioned about the young man that your father saved from hanging. This uh, the young man uh, appeared in the gallery <clears throat> many years after he had been saved from the hanging tree. Was this in Ponca City? In Ponca City, in the gallery uh, that my father, uh, where he took the pictures. This young man came in, loitered around, and uh, visited uh, uh, in a way, and finally made himself known uh, to my father as uh, the man he had been saved, he owed his life, uh, uh, to my father's uh, uh, way of uh, dealing with the ones that sought to kill him. The young man also uh, let it be known to my father that uh, he had been protected by the Indians <clears throat> because this young man had been raised by the Indians and they appreciated uh, the idea of a white man uh, saving him. For that reason, they protected his uh, travels across the prairie, and he was unharmed uh, all the way through. <coughs> but one night, in the middle of the night, he had my father had tied his horses out by the wagon, as usual. He and his dog lay by the side of the uh, wagon for the night's 
sleep, and suddenly, with no noise or warning, he was surrounded with Indians. They were uh, chanting their uh, song dance and hopping up and down with their dance all around his wagon. He was terrified, of course, and thought that uh, his time had come, that he would be taken as other travelers had been. But he decided uh, he uh, would uh, do what he could. He was good at rattling bones, which uh, the pioneers could uh, make a tune with the bones uh, that they uh, could rattle and uh, make a rhythm. He got up and rattled his bones and danced and uh, chanted their uh, tom-tom song around the wagon several times. And they one by one were gone, disappeared into the night. He was bewildered, but went back to his uh, bedroll, decided to rest as, as well as possible the rest of the night. But again through the night, the same thing happened. The, the Indians were around him, surrounded. He was uh, uh, in the midst. He again got up and danced with them. And after a while they disappeared and did not take his horses. They did not harm him or take anything from his wagon. This young man, visiting my father in the gallery at that time, said that they were dancing a peace dance around him to let him know that he would be protected all the way through his travels through the prairie, that they would let no harm come to him. Even though other travelers were harmed? Other travelers were burned out and murdered and mm -hmm. their horses stolen and uh, everything they had lost. Right. Did so, your father have an established trail between Wichita and Fort Reno? An established trail that he followed? Uh, he must have had. He, mm -hmm. Because uh, he, there would be uh, some guide posts along yeah, that he would right. have recognized as being there before, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And uh, I think, as I said, more by instinct than by compass, he followed the route through. Right. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you.